discuss him with the critic of the American Historical Association, and he was one of the first and most ardent and purposeful respondents to Jim's and my piece. And for all those friends, I hope you'll join me in reading them now. setting up this session on short notice. Uh, this responsiveness uh, contrasts with a, a honcho I know at the National History Center who floored me with his perception of the urgency of the jobs crisis by saying that this is definitely something that the AHA should take up in 2013. I want the AHA and its sister organizations like the Organization of American Historians to work now, rapidly and effectively, for a new Works Progress Administration, as well as for increased funding for higher education. We need government funding for students and faculty, just as if this were a civilized country. The Thatcherite two-party consensus in this country is at war with the very idea of public funding. Faculty are being cut, and young historians' lives uh, are poor, brutish, and endlessly migratory as they try to put together enough teaching gigs to, uh, to live on. What we should, of course, rid ourselves of the ancient snobberies and hierarchies about non-academic employment, as uh, Tony Grafton and Jim Grossman have wisely proposed in their articles in the AHA's magazine. It's really just a dead end to tell graduate students who can't find work in ac academe to go look for it outside academe, where there are no jobs either. We need to create jobs, not to parsimoniously redistribute pieces of the shrinking pie. As Thomas Frank puts it in the December Harper's calling, as I do for a new WPA, quote, if we are so concerned about job creation, why not just create jobs? In advocating this, Frank joins growing ranks WPA. What an obvious idea. I live in Manhattan, a few miles north of Zuccotti Park. For all of us, the Occupy movement has expanded our notion of the possible. But what is called pragmatism in this Obama era has infected the thinking of liberal intellectuals, among whom an updated version of end of ideology pervades with its dismissal of the obviously necessary as somehow just too utopian to ask for. Now we are here, say Grafton and Grossman in their articles, and the reality is what it is. I hear in this kind of phrasing echoes of Margaret Thatcher's there is no alternative. Why accommodate to the unacceptable and accept the current banker dictated immiseration as somehow necessary and God-given? It's just dead wrong that the AHA should respond to a proposal for a WPA with archaic arguments that we should work, quote, within an existing framework, cut back PhDs and function only as a clearinghouse. It's working within existing frameworks that got us into the hole that we're in. We're losing a generation of historians. It's time to say, enough is enough. Expand, don't contract. Where will the money come from? Easy. Tax that famous 1% and tax the corporate thieves like GE, which get away with paying zero corporate taxes. We must get over what Wright Mills called crackpot realism. We must see clearly what's going on and think clearly about how to fix it. Don't tell people who can't find jobs in academe to look for other jobs outside academe that also don't exist. It's utopian, for instance, to urge them to find jobs in government unless we oppose the shrinking of government, which is what's going on. How can there be jobs in government when government is shrinking? Another example of the limited quality of AHA's ideas of how political change comes about, Executive Director Jim Grossman tells me that the way to increase public funding is by, quote, 
increasing the presence of historians in positions of influence. Now there's an old-fashioned, top-down, preoccupied model of political change for you. According to Grossman, there are congressional cutbacks in process for NEH, NHPRC, Teaching American History, and other history-related programs. Writing letters to our Congress people is ineffectual in the face of the loony bipartisan budget-cutting mania. And I hear echoes of Grafton and Grossman's uh, title, they called their article, a very modest proposal. I hear echoes of that and the kind of thinking that leads the National Coalition for History, <clears throat> of which the AHA is a member, uh, to call a $2 million budget cut for NHPRC a victory. That's their term. It's a victory since it could have been a much larger cut. Oh my God, Oliver Twist has asked for more. The, the theme here seems to be submit to the marketplace rather than create something new. A long history of radical caucuses has instructed me in the differences between asking professional associations to take political stands as opposed to professional stands. This isn't 1969. I'm not asking the AHA to oppose the war in Vietnam, but simply to fight for the narrower but worthy goal of keeping our profession alive. If anything, my proposal can be attacked from the left as merely defending a guild interest. Congress chartered the AHA in 1899 to promote history. That's what it should do. It should promote history. Despite Grafton and Grossman's insistence that we get real and abandon utopianism, the things that they propose founder on the rocks of the reality of reduced budgets, every place. The economic collapse that limits employment in academe also limits employment in museums, archives, editorial fields, government on all levels, and private corporations. So preparing graduate students for non-academic jobs sounds nice, but it'll take years for whatever impact it might have, and the grad students just don't have the time. What I've said is that this is just plain deck chair stuff while the society and the profession steam towards the iceberg. Consider the employment situation in two areas that uh, Grafton and Grossman pose as alternatives, museums and archives. Tony Grafton has a lively piece on historians working in museums in the latest issue of the AHA's magazine. But at the back of the book, 11 pages of ads present 76 jobs, of which only one is non-academic, song clearing house. The person who is the subject of his article on historians and museums has a temporary two-year position in a program. And the article ends somewhat anticlimatically, quote, let's hope more institutions find ways to give early career scholars a taste of public history. This seems to me pious, I almost said pie in the sky. Consider jobs in archives, another of Grafton and Grossman's major models. William and Mary College's apprenticeships in museum and archival management, which they cite as exemplary, have, they acknowledge, disappeared for budgetary reasons. And it's very hard to imagine states hiring archivists as state budgets collapse. Wisconsin? California? Are you kidding? So in the face of all these failures of supposedly practical alternatives to academic jobs, I'm asking for a new WPA. Liberalism in the Obama era is so decayed that it takes a radical to speak up for simple liberal values. I don't share the nostalgia for the New Deal, which is rampant in the left that has forgotten the word socialism. I'm sure that in 1935, I would have had a critique from the left of the inadequacy of the New Deal. So my proposal for a WPA is, within the spectrum of possibilities, quite a moderate one, and should get the support of other professional organizations and individuals, left and right. What finally was the New Deal Federal Writers Project? It lasted from 1935 to 1943, and with employment as its stated purpose,
provided jobs for some 7,500 people, only some of whom were historians. In history, WPA gave us such landmark, valuable projects as the 10,000 pages of interviews with former slaves in the Slave Narratives Collection, the 53 volumes of the American Guide series, and the Historical Records Survey. Of course, these things were flawed in their way. Consider the artifacts uh, corrupting the interviews with former slaves, as well as outright censorship uh, by some state editors. But all that means is that with that experience behind us, we can do better things. Uh, what would a new WPA look like? Tom Frank suggests that we should be sending the unemployed into the nation's libraries to scan old newspapers and periodicals and make these universally available online. Good, but we can go beyond that to a general program to digitize and make available online all sorts of local records, census data, etc. And that, funded by a WPA, would provide valuable work for hundreds of historians. Now, within my time limits, I'm going to have to cut, unfortunately, the meat of more of the kinds of projects that I propose that a WPA do. Uh, maybe we can get to those later in discussion. I should note that although much of the excitement that I've heard as I've talked to people about what a WPA would do, uh, much of that excitement has come from uh, quantitative, demographically oriented uh, historians. Um, but not being one such, it has always struck me that the sources that they're interested in uh, can also be used for reconstructing the lives and even biographies of ordinary people. I've done some of this manually, tracing uh, one Revolutionary War veterans migrations uh, in the early 19th century, using in part the local records assembled in microfilm by the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. And for the living, a new WPA could undertake projects in more recent oral history with the scope of the original slave narratives collection. Well, how would we get this new WPA? Let me say in regard to implementation that the AHA would hardly be alone in seeking this and might in fact arrive